To you millennials out there, I'm sorry. To the entitled generation of millennials, I'm sorry. To all of you who received a participation award for showing up in sports, I'm sorry. And I'm sorry because your generation has got a much tougher world to face than my generation, even my parents' generation. And in fact, to leave a legacy or to create a legacy, you're gonna have to make enough money in your life to live your life. By the way, you're gonna live longer. And by the way, there's no such thing as pensions anymore or Medicaid or Social Security and, and the world could really blow up in any moment. So, well, I'm sorry. You have a uh, tough task, but I think you're up to it and I think you can do it. And by the way, I'm gonna guide you through the story and if uh, I did it, you know, definitely you can do it. I grew up and there was a sign in our kitchen that said, if a man tells you he achieved something without struggle, don't believe it. If someone tells you they achieved something and they struggle, you made them believe them. That comes from the tone. I also grew up in a home that had a sign that said, if you're gonna walk on thin ice, you might as well dance. So I guess I was trained from early on that life is a challenge, but you should have some fun for it. Lesson learned. Be optimistic. It's okay to be optimistic. You must be optimistic. When I was a little kid, I found a journal ledger uh, in the basement. My father was an accountant. And when other kids played, whatever they played, school or house, whatever, I ran a business. I have a passion for business. That's really my thing. And I love this. I love writing the checks, the invoices, hiring people, firing people, whatever. <laughs> you know, that, that's what I did. And then when I was 14 or 50 years old, I had a lobster business. I grew up uh, 20 miles north of Boston. I had a boat and I had lobster traps and I sold them kind of uniquely. I put a sign in the beauty parlor nearby and said, cute kid will deliver lobster. <laughs> Maybe that was the first Uber business model. You know, we'll, we'll have to wait and see about that. And then one day a hurricane came and wiped out all my traps, gone. I showed up for breakfast the next morning. My parents looked terrible. And I'm like, what's the matter with you? And they're looking at me, are you okay? I'm like, of course I'm okay. I'm gonna start a water taxi business today. <laughs> Be optimistic. <laughs> so for you kids out there, you millennials, here's the deal. You're gonna have four to six careers, and each one's gonna last four to six years, and that's gonna be how you create your legacy. You no longer can go work for AT&T for 20 years, retire and have a pension. This is what you have to piece together. It sounds frightening. In fact, when I speak over at the Harvard Business School about Pooley's favorite subject, why there's no MBA in sales, which is it's amazing, you have a, a population of kids at the 98th percentile of strategic analysis and they're 2 percentile of risk. You know, they're afraid, they're fearful. What are, what are they so afraid of? You know, what is the big fear? You know, it's the fear of kind of rejection. And by the way, when you give into fear, you rob yourself of future opportunity. Fear is a primal thing. That whole kind of fight or flee, that's a primal thing, like a predator is gonna eat you. No one is gonna eat you in your career. This is not fear that you face, it's the unknown. Actually, it's anxiety. And there's a big difference between fear and anxiety. Fear is when you know what you're afraid of. Anxiety is when you don't. But there are ways to deal with anxiety. Uh, I think a lot of you know that uh, in order to kind of uh, be calm, you need to stay present. In order to stay present, be calm, you need to weed out all the why nots, all the can nots, all the, you know, it won't, I don't, you know, all of that. So I'd like to show you, it's kind of a tour through how I was lucky enough to parlay this four to six and four to six by kind of taking risks and, and moving forward. And the lesson here, of course, is you know, if I can do it, definitely uh, you can. My career by numbers, I'm 58 years old. I've had eight career changes, one family crisis, nine mentors, and I want to talk about mentors. This notion of having someone to latch onto, some super people to grab onto their kid, really important. But it's a give take type of thing. Of course, the most important number on here is 30. In this November, I'll be married for 30 years, which I think is uh, the greatest accomplishment of all time.
Well, you know that's from my life. So I'm here. <laughs> uh, it was November 1980. I was 21 years old. I was a graduate of Bentley University, Bentley College. Uh, my brother told me, he was a great mentor and friend of mine, there's three industries that are going to take off in that decade. Cable, uh, cable TV, solar energy, microcomputers. Well, pick one of those, get involved, what the heck. Just jumped in and took a job selling computers on a retail sales floor. I was 21 years old. I showed up my first day in a worn out green cashmere jacket. I knew absolutely nothing. But it was all this like activity around me, by the way. That's two years before the IBM PC even came out. And then I went into the back room and I tried to figure out what was going on because I was curious. And the lesson here is to be curious. It's hard to be curious. This generation wants to be told what to do, but being curious is asking why, what, how, you know, all this kind of stuff that really engages you with someone and trying to learn. And I learned about these computers and something very interesting happening in this whole, well, you know, this whole PC era which uh, really started. And by uh, 1982, I was able to parlay that into working as a manufacturer's rep. Most manufacturers, software and hardware, went to market via manufacturer's reps, a commission only uh, sales force. And I joined the manufacturer's rep force, and it was run by a guy named Mark. And Mark was 5'2", like the Chihuahua with a German Shepherd Park. <laughs> I was petrified of him. I mean, he knew everything. This is the man who introduced Pioneer Electronics to America. And he was going out on some cruise that they had one, and they say, he said, Woody, go sell uh, printers to every Apple dealer in New England. And I'm like, what? Yeah, go sell printers. Uh, Apple just came up with printers. Go sell everything in the New England. And I learned, uh, I said, of course, yes, sir. But what I learned to do is manage myself. And this is a great lesson because people uh, wait to be managed. If you want to be successful in the 46 by 46, you have to be your own manager. <laughs> well, then I did this for five years, and uh, 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 you know, we, we grew a rep firm and all that, what I learned is when you're selling products and selling things in volume, it isn't products that matter, it's personality that matters. It's bring an opinion to everything. It's be yourself, have a story. People don't buy products, they buy from people. They buy stories. You know, they, they buy something that's bigger than any physical product. And then I was uh, lucky enough in 1987, I was 27 years old, uh, to get recruited into the largest software company in the world. Lotus Development. And uh, well, I didn't have a green cashmere jacket, I got dressed in a full suit, vest, overcoat. My wife got me a briefcase of watch and the shiny shoes and the whole thing. And I went to work in this beautiful building in Cambridge. I was petrified. I'm like, oh my God, this is like a real company. And, uh, and, and, uh, and I hit, they had a library. They actually bought subscriptions to all these newsletters I had only heard about. And I hid in the library and finally a great mentor to, to me, Frank and Gary, said, wait, write down everything you know about distribution. And I did, and eventually that became the company's distribution strategy. And as my career at Lotus worked, the CEO would call me, Jim Manzi, and say, Woody, uh, why don't you go do this? And one day he called me and said, Woody, why don't you go start the OEM business uh, for Lotus, which is when you bundle software and other people's computers. And, uh, and I paused, <laughs> and he said, uh, you know, really, he goes, what's the matter, are you afraid? I'm like, no, I'm not afraid. And, and that kind of, kind of maybe shook me out of uh, fear, you know, but I you know, learned a lot about that. And then about this time, computers were being networked, and it was 1992, and I got a call from a startup company in Cambridge, Mass. A couple of kids on MIT, um, start, you know, we're inventing this networking project. And I met with uh, the great venture capitalist, Henry McCants, who founded Greylock, and he uh, was a mentor to me. And I don't know how this happened or why I said it, but I did. This is the story part, I guess. I said, uh, Henry, I want to go work as a VP of sales and marketing at one of your companies, make you a lot of money. And then I want to be a CEO of one of your companies and make you a lot of money. And then I want to become a venture capitalist. And I don't know how that all happened, but that's, I kind of pre-programmed myself. <laughs> and uh, Shiva became one of these things where I learned about being passionate and working hard. I tried to be the hardest worker in that company. 
You know, I tried to be the one when I, I did the London, uh, Boston, London, Paris, Tokyo trip once a month, almost died in Japan from the chicken pox on that route, but I tried to be the last person leaving the office in Boston, first person uh, in London. And remember how I said, you know, it didn't matter at the beginning, you know, just get on any spaceship, you know, which I did, but this company was a spaceship. This company was a rocket. And I hope everybody gets to feel the power of uh, visualization and the power of a team. When everyone on the team agrees that they are a Ferrari, that team acts like a Ferrari. And then in 1997, I suppose uh, 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 dreams do come true. Angels do uh, answer your prayers. And I, uh, I got recruited out of Shiva and I became the CEO of the company. Based in Calgary, Alberta, of all those things. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I learned that being a CEO is a really lonely thing. I learned that being a real true leader when everything falls on your shoulders is a very lonely thing. And you can't really go home and complain about it, and your board doesn't want to hear it, and most certainly your team doesn't want to hear it. But I found Golden Retrievers a great listener. <laughs> In fact, my dog Remy, you know, listens to every single word I have to say. <laughs> uh, but I learned, I learned about this uh, perseverance and this passion needing to win, and then ultimately uh, moved MCK to Boston and you know reorganized management and all that. And the company was lucky enough to go public on my birthday in 1997. And then the stock market crash happened. If you remember around 2000, it was pretty bad. And our stock went from like 50 to five, and well, I took that personally. You know, and, and I felt horrible. I felt like you know it, it was on my shoulders, and I made the biggest mistake I ever made in my life. And I hired someone to replace me because I felt I was the wrong person, and that was uh, a real mistake, and uh, that's something I really do regret uh, every day. But I was able to parlay that into kind of the final. <laughs> vision and then became a venture capitalist in 2001. I worked for a bank in New York called Lazar in September 2001 I joined. Uh, you remember that was probably not the greatest month to join a New York bank. Probably not the greatest time to invest, but maybe the greatest time to learn. And I learned from the great venture capitalist, Russ Planitzer, about being a venture capitalist and doing the work and doing the work. And he told me, you have to go look at 100 houses before you buy one. I'm like, what? Yeah, you have to go look at 100 deals before you work through the check. I'm like, okay, boss. You know, but that was really the work of doing the work. And then I learned, because now I'm a venture capitalist with a super exclusive club, that the other club members don't really want you there. <laughs> you know, I didn't get like a welcome party to the VC club. No VC wants new VCs coming in. That's kind of how it works. So I learned to be iconoclastic. I learned to think for myself. I learned that this is a lonely game and you have to stick to your guns. You have to be yourself. Lazar changed the direction in 2004. I joined a firm uh, in prison. And in prison, the, uh, one of the first companies I looked at was a company called 3AM Software in, uh, in Hungary. This company eventually became uh, logged me in. But when I was looking at that company, I heard from a brand new venture capitalist that they're gonna pass on the deal because they had talked to the CIO of Fidelity and Fidelity didn't think it was a great idea. And I thought to myself, that's very interesting, but not very useful. And I went ahead and did that deal, and boy am I glad I am. It's 14 years later, I'm still on the board. I think the reason I'm still on the board, the CEO would tell you I'm a provocateur which I think is a great compliment. <laughs> but I think that means he like, sees it and uh, says it uh, uh, as it is. And then along this journey, I saw a company that was putting video on the internet, and I'm thinking, well, yeah, that's probably gonna happen, and everyone's like, that won't happen, you know, this reason, that reason, cable isn't passing up homes, and here's the lesson learned. If something is freaking obvious, it's freaking obvious. <laughs> I'm just saying. I did that deal, it was called Maven Networks. Franco came out of Maven and that uh, we eventually uh, sold to Yahoo. Then sometimes in life, as uh, it happens, one of my children got uh, very young. Uh, not the type of uh, go to the hospital and get fixed still, but one of these uh, life uh, situations. And I learned this. I learned uh, I can't control everything. I learned that uh, I need to understand and not judge and I learned to go all in. 
I think our whole family learned to go all in. Very humbling, very isolated. And then somehow, step by step, uh, we got through that. And today, I'm, a, I, uh, I'm an investor with uh, Launch Capital, and we invest in millennials all the time. Every day, uh, we're writing checks to millennials. And here's what I know about you. You are anxious. You are critical. You are unhappy. And you feel stuck, and you feel you should be somewhere else, and all, and all this. But you know what? I know you don't want to hear from me, but what I really do understand is that you're very good at listening to each other. So with other business leaders in Boston or at Bernstein and Mass Challenge, we're forming this Boston Buddies system, matching up millennials to talk to other millennials to coach them. You millennials today are expert at describing exactly what your problem is. <laughs> However, there's not a lot of <laughs> solutions uh, you know, being uh, presented there, and hopefully, uh, hopefully you know, this will help. Because I'm telling you, if I can do this, you can do this. You can be optimistic. You can say, you know, the heck with why nots. You know, the heck with all this stuff. You know, you can take a risk and all that will be okay. And then I look back at all this, all this I've learned, and what I've really learned is this, is to be curious. What I've really learned is to be passionate in having a, a need to win. And what I've really learned is to be yourself. And then as uh, the great artist Frank Zappa says, you are what you is. And if today, if it was my last day and I was out there, uh, you know, as a lobsterman again, I would be one happy person. Thank you very much.